And I'm thrilled to, uh, again, have this opportunity to share some ideas and reflections of my personal study of ancient Egypt, Stargate Egypt, and the, uh, and the light body teachings of the ancient Egyptians. My wife, Claire, and I, as many of you may know, uh, lead tours to sacred Egypt. We've just come back from our, our 18th tour in February of, of this year. And we had just an astounding time. We're so honored and grateful to be able to take people back to the motherland, as we call Egypt, and to be able to bring people back to themselves, and back to their, their true selves, back to their, their higher selves. And what we want to uh, accomplish today, and I'm just gonna make sure I've got the, uh, the right screen, there we go, pardon me. What we're going to accomplish today, again, is based in large part on personal reflections and photos of, uh, of scenes and temple walls that I've collected throughout my journeys into Egypt. And uh, I think what you're gonna find is that we're really now today on, on the cusp of understanding ancient Egypt in a way that perhaps we never have before. We have some astounding technology that's come online. We have new ideas and inspirations, especially concerning the human light body and ascension that have really given us a, a really welcome window into the ancient Egyptian thinking about our ascension and transformation. If you are interested in perhaps getting information about any of our upcoming tours, you can visit my website, which is williamhenry.net. My email is whenrytn at earthlink.net. That's whenrytn at earthlink.net. Drop me a line, I'll be happy to send you a copy of our brochure. So let's start from the kind of the beginning for me of when I started to really look into the ancient Egyptian light body teachings. My quest begins with this very obscure mathematician named Dr. Charles Musaeus or Charles Muses. He used a couple of pen names. Back in 1996, I, I happened to find myself in his former home in Denver, Colorado. It was called Falcon Wing. And it was, he built it basically as a temple to Isis. And back then, I, I didn't know who he was and had just begun my journey into looking into ancient Egypt. And I remember going to his home shortly after he had passed, and I had been given a couple of copies of his books. And it was, uh, to, to my mind, a kind of an, an unordinary or extraordinary circumstance that later had in my opinion, profound influence on, on my life and my quest. Because as I started to look into the work of Dr. Musaeus or Dr. Muses, I found some tremendous inspiration. Dr. Muses proposed that the ancient Egyptians had developed a technology, his term, in which tones, lights, and an as yet unidentified plant are used to, trig to trigger, as he said, or open a rusty valve that triggered the production of large pulses of hormones, like extiso, produced by, similar to that produced by larval forms of insects, which allows the adult form of the insect to emerge, or the, the metamorphose, uh, excuse me, metamorphosed form of the insect. In this way, he said, this would allow the gestation or mutation of a non-molecular body, a new skin, that would allow the survival of consciousness beyond physical death. So we're talking tones, lights, and plants that could cause or stimulate this metamorphic transmutation of our body into light, into a light being form that our consciousness could then be deposited at our time of death, and then we would continue on. This is a, a 5,000 year old science. And as those who are uh, pay attention to my blog, readers of my blog or participants of workshops know, I have established that 5,000 year timeline as a benchmark for human transcendence, this quest that humanity has to evolve beyond our larval form, our pupil phase, this human flesh and blood phase into our ascended light being phase. And as I discuss uh, quite regularly, in Silicon Valley, Beijing, other technology centers, software engineers, 
designers are trying to come up with a way of creating a new version of humanity using digital technology. I call it the skingularity. Their aim is exactly the same as what the ancient Egyptians had, to create a, a new body of light into which we can copy and paste the contents of our brain, maybe even our soul, into a new body of light that will be able to continue on into eternity. So when we look at scenes such as this on the back of the throne chair of King Tutankhamun, we see an anointing scene. We also see the use of a plant. We, in fact, the, the Tutankhamun's wife, Anka Sunamun, is here anointing him with the blue lotus oil, the sacred blue lotus oil that is going to empower Tutankhamun. It's going to transform him. It's going to raise him from a man to more like a god man. So we have a plant here, and we have tones and lights. Can you see just above the head of Tutankhamun and Akasunamun, we have the light of the Atan. I'm going to go back. The light of the Atan. This is the not the sun, although it's symbolized by the sun. The Atan, according to Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten, the Atan was actually the light that illuminates the sun. So think about that. What is the light that illuminates our sun? And think of the expansion of consciousness that is suggested by such a statement or a thought experiment. Well, on the back of Tutankhamun's throne chair here, he is being anointed by the tones of the Atan, symbolized by the key of life, the rays that come from the Atan culminate in hands that offer the key of life to both, to both Tutankhamun and Anka Sunamun. So they're being baptized in the rays or the tones of the Atan. And we have obviously lights coming from the Atan as well, and they plant. We also notice that both are wearing transparent linen garments, which as we see is going to uh, be developed as a symbol for our light body, our next level of spiritual evolution. These are photos I took back in February of Tutankhamun's throne chair. You see it with this footstool on the left and on the right. You see the winged, the winged serpents on either side of the arms, along with the, the two lions in the frontal view. But on the side, we see the winged serpents, which is a very key symbol in our quest. We're gonna be talking about the winged serpents as we continue here in just a moment. And so here we see that winged serpent in detail. It's very nice uh, when we're visiting Egypt these days that uh, they allow legal photography in the Cairo Museum. We used to have to go illegal, try to snap a photo here and there. Uh, sometimes they'd ask you to leave the museum if you got caught. So fortunately, they've loosened up on uh, the photography rules almost throughout uh, the entirety of of all the Egyptian temples now, including the Valley of the Kings, the tombs, you're allowed to take photos, whereas just a couple years ago, as a complete no-no. So it's very fortunate for us to be able to go into the Cairo Museum now and be able to use our, uh, our cameras. So here in the detail, once again, we're seeing Anka Sunamun anointing Tutankhamun. This is a tremendously archetypal scenario. We see something very similar 12, 1400 years later, in the anointing of Jesus by Mary Magdalene. Same effect, possibly even the same oils were used by Mary Magdalene in her anointing of Jesus. In fact, there's a, a lot of research out there that, that tells us that Mary Magdalene and Jesus were part of the, the mystic tribe of the Essenes, and that the Essenes were in fact reviving the, the light body mysteries of Akhenaten, which passed through Tutankhamun and, and Anka Sunamun. So here in the Cairo Museum is a, a wonderful stella that shows Akhenaten worshiping or being baptized by the light of the Atan, the light that illuminates the sun. And in the detail, we see the serpent hanging from the disc and hanging from the serpent is the key of life, establishing this connection that the Atan does in fact broadcast or transmit keys, tones, or vibrations. Again, traditional Egyptologists would like you to consider that this is actually the sun 
But Akhenaten is emphatic in saying that the Atan is the light that illuminates the sun, and our sun then becomes a sort of a step-down transformer in a way, or transmitter of these much higher frequency vibrations or rays coming from the Atan. What's interesting about this is that the Stanford Solar Observatory has recently proven that our sun, in fact, is a musical instrument. They describe it as, a, as an organ, like a pipe organ. It plays over a million notes simultaneously. So maybe Akhenaten knew of one note or several keys or notes that he could bring into the earth plane that could assist us in our transformation and our ascension. Because indeed, as we follow the, the trail of Akhenaten, we're led to this contemplation that this mystic figure was in fact introducing to the ancient Egyptians some very powerful concepts about the light body, our ascension body, and about our ability to sync with keys, tones, or vibrations coming maybe even from a higher dimension. And this is what we see in these stellas here, all again in the Cairo Museum in Egypt. These would have been placed on altars in personal homes in Tel El Armana, the name of the new capital city that, that Akhenaten built. It, he famously shut down all of the Egyptian temples, dispatched or fired the whole bureaucracy of ancient Egyptian gods, dismantled the priesthood and told the people all they needed was one of these tablets in their home, on their altar, and that through Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti channeling those rays, that they too could be, feel the baptism of the rays of the Atan. So what happened was, is of course, it's this, this revolution of Akhenaten spun Egypt into chaos. Ultimately, the military stepped in and they destroyed, attempted to erase every single possible reference that existed of the existence of, of Akhenaten. So we're very fortunate that some of these tablets, some of these altar pieces uh, have come to us down uh, through the ages and we can stand face to face with them in the Cairo Museum. They are objects of, of immense power and also immense mystery. This one happens to be in the Berlin Museum, the new museum in Berlin. A uh, very powerful, intimate ceremony where we see Akhenaten Again, with Nefertiti, his wife, their children, all being anointed or baptized in the rays of the Atan. As we follow the, uh, the child, the daughter that's in Akhenaten's uh, hands, we see that she is pointing to a three-pronged glyph. This is the Egyptian glyph for mist, which could be the basis for our root word mystery. He is anointing her in the mysteries of the Atan and awakening her into this higher consciousness. I covered this in my earlier Stargate Egypt webinar, which also is available at uh, portaltoascension.com and also available on my flash drives at williamhenry.net. In this detail, we note that Nefertiti wears a transparent linen robe with a sash. I also discuss, discuss, uh, discuss the, the mysteries of this sash in that previous Stargate Egypt webinar. It's the really the, the key thread of all of the light body mysteries in my view. It, it ties together the ancient Egyptian mysteries, goes through the Christian mysteries, goes right up on into, de, to, into today. It basically symbolizes a lifeline between humanity and the divine realm. In Egyptian sim symbolism, the red sash symbolizes the afterlife garment of light, as does the transparent garment that Nefertiti is wearing. And it suggests to me that what's being shown in these baptism scenes is that Nefertiti is actually, as well as Akhenaten and her family, are all receiving the keys, tones, or vibrations, the light rays from the Atan, and it is assisting them in crafting their non-molecular light body garment, as Musea has described it. This process is also illuminated for us on the incredible artwork from the, uh, from the tomb of King Tutankhamun in the Cairo Museum. Uh, presently, we have all of those wonderful nested boxes that Tutankhamun's 
coffin was placed within. On the exterior of those coffins are scenes such as this, which describe Tutankhamun's transformation into a being of light. The alchemical transmutation of his body through the light of the stars. But as Musaeus told us, there's, just, there's not just the light of the stars that's involved, there's also tones and plants, possibly the plant being the, the sacred blue lotus, but possibly other plants as well. What we see in this scene is a star, probably Sirius, with three rays or beams of light coming from it. As Musaeus notes, in Egypt, the etheric or quintessence was represented in the form of a five-pointed Saba star. The word Saba or star also means door, and with the determinative for walking, which is also included in this scene, it meant passing through a star door. And it suggests to me that what they're actually talking about is Tutankhamun actually walking through a star gate. Now, was he successful in this Stargate transmutation? I can't say for sure. We actually have his mummy. We know that the mummification process was part of the ascension process of the ancient Egyptians. And it may be that, that part of Tutankhamun is now a star walker and that he is enjoying his non-molecular light body walking in the stars forever. So, very interesting the way this is preserved for us in the ancient Egyptian uh, temple scenes, and it's most notably here on Tutankhamun's uh, burial chest. As Musaeus continues, he tells us that the principal agent of transmutation, in addition to tones, lights, and plants, was a divine food, as he described it, that like some super royal jelly, like that of the bees, would stimulate metaphoric, or excuse me, metamorphic neurosecretory organs in the central nervous system and enable a super biological process to take place to mature a higher body that can transcend death and is capable of furnishing a sensorium to perceive and function in a world freer in which we are than the one in which we are currently confined. This, says Muses, was the ageless promise that ancient Egypt held forth most explicitly. So, tones, lights, plants, and some kind of a divine food. Ever since Lawrence Gardner published his books on Ormes and the light body food and manna, people have been looking at these scenes on the temple walls and wondering, were the ancient Egyptians indeed practicing the alchemy of producing white powder gold, as it's described, this, this manna or star food that we know that the ancient Egyptians claimed that they produ were producing that could alter the, the biological body and ultimately could feed the light body. I think Lawrence has taken us a really good way down the road here towards reacquiring these ancient Egyptian mysteries. And in our tours and in our ex explorations of Egypt, still documenting uh, that science. And this is what we're seeing in some of these scenes here where the pharaohs are offering that star food, and I'll go back and show that again, to Horus or to various gods, including Amun, who's portrayed here. These are extraordinary scenes that basically tell the god, I know the secrets of the superfood, of the white powder gold, of the manna that feeds my light body. And I can't point to anybody today that has exactly duplicated this food, but I can say in general that we are well on our way towards attempting to find out. This celestial or star food was said to heighten the Pharaoh's powers of perception, awareness, and intuition, and was responsible for an overall transcendence of personality to the angelic state. Now, it's very interesting in light of the research I've been doing recently that Lawrence Gardner maintains, as do others, that Tutmosis III was actually the founder of the, this alchemical tradition, and that he was also the founder of the Essene tradition, which is very interesting speculation. And I'll be having much more to say uh, very soon about the Essenes and their ability to produce this angel food or star food. As Musaeus continues, he tells us that all this brings us to a key point about ancient Egyptian ethnobotany. 
that ingestion of the sacred material was designed not merely to give a high, but to trigger and impel the metamorphic process leading to a theurgic transmutation of human nature into apotheosis. Metamorphous, metamorphic process all obviously refers to transfiguration or a change of form. A theurgic transmutation refers to the divine work. In sacred traditions, you have theology, which is God talk or talking about God. This is what theologians do. Then you have theurgy, which means the divine work, to do the work of the gods. The work that the gods always wanted humanity to do was to transform into divine beings. That is the meaning of the word apotheosis, to raise from a human to a divine level. And it, it kind of bothers me in a way that we've gotten kind of sidetracked in the past maybe 20 years or so by assertions that the gods somehow came to earth to mine gold and that they were attempting to mine this gold, but they weren't successful in mining enough of it fast enough. So they genetically altered a primitive form of human into a worker race, into a slave race, so that these new primitive humans could do the work of the gods, mining gold. That never rang true to me, even though it's virtually a religion today in the kind of ancient astronaut or ancient alien theorist realm, if you will. Zechariah Sitchin was the primary promoter of this idea. So I refer to this as the gospel of Zechariah Sitchin. He came up with this interpretation that these God beings came to earth, created us as a slave race to mine gold. In my view, I mean, that is possible because there's no question that the ancient Egyptians used a tremendous amount of gold. I mean, we're talking hundreds upon hundreds of tons. Virtually everything was covered with gold. If you're walking into a temple and it had a door, it was covered with gold. Many of the scenes on the temple walls were covered with gold. Gold was practically as plentiful as sand in ancient Egypt. And they had an unbelievable mastery of working with gold. So they had to get it out of the ground somehow. Maybe, maybe they did create a slave race in order to do this. However, we also know and are told, in fact, by Mr. Sitchin himself in his speculations that these god beings were alchemists. An alchemist has as his primary goal or task the transmutation of one element into another. Lead to gold, coal to diamond, flesh to celestial flesh or our light body. So why would an alchemist need to come to earth and violate a so-called prime directive and create a slave race to mine gold for it? Why wouldn't he just take a hunk of lead and transmute it? Wouldn't that be easier? I'm wondering. Furthermore, it suggests to me this idea that, again, getting back to the idea of theurgy, the divine work, that the work that we do for God and the gods is our divine work, our apotheosis to raise ourselves from humans into God beings. And that to me is the, 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 the work that I seek to, to spend my time exploring and operate from this premise that these divine beings came to earth on a mission to assist us in not enslaving us, but in our ascension. This process of ascension was overseen by these cosmic regions, these living archetypes of stellar powers. I believe that the god beings of ancient Egypt were real beings, that they were probably super high frequency light beings that could take on physical form. And to attain awareness, of these star powers or star beings is one of our primary goals, if not the primary goal 
in our own quest for ascension. At the very top of the list of the gods of ascension, if you will, is the Egyptian god Ptah, the creator god, the craft, god of craftsmen. Ptah, in fact, is the namesake of Egypt itself. The word Egypt is a Greek corruption of hygepsos, which means the house of the Ka, or light body, of Ptah. So Egypt itself is named after this very powerful god, Egypt, Egyptos. You can see Ptah in the very name Egypt. Ptah, according to Egyptian mythology and sacred tradition, came from Sirius, the star system Sirius. He has a wife or a consort. Her name is Sekhmet. As she's portrayed here, she's the lion-headed goddess and protector of humanity. When we go to the Egyptian Hieroglyphic Dictionary, we find the business card, if you will, of Ptah. He is the architect of heaven and earth, the master craftsman in working metals, sculptor, designer, and the fashioner of the bodies of men. He was the blacksmith, sculptor, and mason of the gods. The fashioner of the bodies of men. Now, something that I'm on record of as saying and kind of out here on a limb on my own is to say, well, look at this hieroglyph of Ptah. Can we see a double helix in his hieroglyph? I believe so. We also see the flag or hatchet symbol of the netter, of another term for, for the gods. And we also see a symbol for a temple. So if you're talking to a traditional Egyptologist, they're going to be kind of laughing at us at the moment with this suggestion that Ptah or the ancient Egyptians knew anything about genetics. And just because the god, the ancient Egyptians said, fashion the human body, has a double helix in his hieroglyph, that, that really doesn't mean anything. It doesn't prove that he's a geneticist. But to me, it takes us a long way down the road towards speculating that perhaps Ptah was in fact this otherworldly being who came to Earth on a mission. He is the same as Enki in the Sumerian tradition. And returning back to Zechariah Sitchin's gospel, Enki is the geneticist in the Sumerian tradition, Sitchin says, that tweaked the human body and also created us as a slave race. And that, that just doesn't tally or reconcile with what the ancient Egyptians said about Ptah. Very comfortable in them possibly being interchangeable symbolically and mythologically as the same figure, but their mission is completely different. As portrayed on the, the walls of Queen Nefertari's tomb, in the Valley of the Queens in Upper Egypt, Ptah served a very powerful role. His role, according to this scene, was that he provided to Nefertari her transparent garment of life, her non-molecular light body into which her consciousness could be deposited into the afterlife. That is what these four hieroglyphs symbolize that she is offering to Ptah. They symbolize new clothes. And the way I read this scenario here is that she is thanking Ptah for the gift of altering her DNA so that her consciousness then could be amplified and she could then begin this process of transmutation or manifestation of her non-molecular light body that would put her in a similar body to what we see Ptah in here. As we see Ptah in his golden shrine, he stands on a stone block that symbolizes Mat, or cosmic order. He wears a tight-fitting garb, or garment, referred to as the crossed garment by the ancient Egyptians, the crossed garment. He holds in his hand a combined resurrection stick that is a combination of the Uaz, Ankh, and Jed symbols, meaning life and stability. It's his resurrection stick that enables him to open the gates of heaven. Behind him is the multicolored stairway to heaven, the Tet pillar, the power pillar, pillar also symbolizing resurrection. Very importantly, Ptah not only 
fashioned the human body, he also is responsible for creating the ark of the millions of years or the ship of eternity, as it's also called, the craft that the soul will sail upon into eternity once it has crafted or made its non-molecular light body. In this instance here, we're looking at a, a king, one of the Ptolemaic kings from the ceiling of the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. And he stands holding his resurrection stick, sailing towards the constellation of Orion. Something that I noticed a long time ago and what I refer to as my Robert Baval moment, that moment when Robert Baval looks at the, the, th the pattern of the three pyramids of Giza, looks up at the three belt stars of Orion and makes that mirror connection, that heaven to earth as above, so below connection. Back in 2003, I looked up at the ceiling of Nandera and said, wait a minute, the way the ancient Egyptians portrayed the arc of the millions of years looks exactly like the way modern science portrays a wormhole. And that started me on this quest to, to understand the possibility that the ancient Egyptians were familiar with the wormhole, or certainly the symbolism of the wormhole, as a mechanism through which the soul can travel the cosmos. We all experience a birth, we experience a life, and we experience a death. That cycle is modeled by the wormhole. We all experienced an inhuman past. We didn't come from Earth originally, we came from somewhere else. We all experience a life, which we call the present. And we will all experience a resurrection in the future. We will perhaps return to the stars. And this is what we see modeled by the ancient Egyptians is that they portray their resurrected beings sailing the stars as eternal beings on their wormhole-shaped arcs of the millions of years. This connection that I've, again, fused way back in, 2003, launched me on this quest along with this material of Charles Musaeus to, to try to put together as much as we can about the ancient Egyptian light body teachings. And it suggested to me that if Ptah is the one who fashioned the human body, that perhaps, or perhaps he must have tweaked our body so that it could be more adaptive to traveling the stars through a wormhole. One thing I know for certain is this flesh and blood body is not going to sit on this feathered ascension throne and travel the stars. It is only our non-molecular light body that is capable of making this journey. And so it's very important for us to begin to connect with mentally, physically, and spiritually, and emotionally, our future self, which is what we see portrayed on the, on the temple walls. Here we see the Ptolemaic king wearing the crown of wisdom with his lotus craft, the Ark of the Millions of Years, his feathered ascension throne, he's got his resurrection stick, and the ancient Egyptian symbol, the key of life. In my opinion, these are all aspects of our light body psycho-spiritual attributes. It's not like we're going to go down to Nordstrom and go buy the latest key of life. Target won't sell you or Best Buy won't sell you the latest resurrection stick. This is all developed from within us. It's conscious awareness, opening up our crown, recognizing that our resurrection stick is probably our spinal cord system. The key of life in ancient Egypt is compassion in action. All of this ultimately assists us in, in manifesting our resurrection throne, our feathered resurrection throne, in opening the stargates or wormholes that take us into eternity. This, in my opinion, is why Ptah was here. This is the teaching of Ptah and Sekhmet. And the record of this teaching is left for us on various temple walls, including Medinet Habu, where we see this beautiful depiction of Ptah as a blue-green being. Same thing here with Sekhmet. She's also portrayed as blue-green. We're going to talk in a moment about why they are portrayed as blue-green beings. Back at Medinet Habu, once again, another great representation of Ptah. When we're on tour, I'm very often paying as close attention as I can to Ptah 
looking at the columns, looking at the temple walls, taking the pictures and bringing Ptah's energy into my consciousness. Because I know that Ptah is probably two things. He is both a stellar consciousness who's capable of transmitting his consciousness across vast distances and communicating with us, especially in dreams, which is what we learned at Saqqara. And he could also be a physical being as well. He could manifest himself physically in an incarnate form. We're going to see that this is literally true here in just a moment. Uh, I want to share this with you. We were in the Sekhmet Chapel at Karnak Temple, a very special place where you see this just absolutely incredible 3,500-year-old living statue of Sekhmet. It's one of Claire's favorite stops on our tours. And on this particular occasion, Claire, as you can see, is, is crouching at the feet of Sekhmet. She is touching her hands to the statue. And look to behind Claire, who's on the left. Look at what is coming out of the wall. A couple of our guests were flabbergasted, gobsmacked, when they saw this image and asked, is it possible that that is actually Sekhmet? Or could it even be Ptah? who is stepping out of some other world and into that chapel at that moment. I can't say yes or no for sure, but it sure is a provocative scene. Another couple examples of Ptah. Just want you to be very familiar with the representations of how Ptah is portrayed in the Egyptian temple walls. This, uh, these examples here are actually at uh, the temple of Seti I at, at Abydos. A couple more examples here from Abydos. There are they're just absolutely mind-boggling images when you think about what the story is behind this figure of a benevolent celestial being comes to earth from Sirius on a mission to augment the human body, to tweak it so that we can become more like the divine beings and that we in fact can ascend from the earth plane. That is the essential and core mystery of Ptah. And now coming back to Nefertari's tomb, we see the, this anointing by not just Ptah, but also by Isis, where we once again see Nefertari wearing her transparent linen garment, the object of the light body quest of the ancient Egyptians with her red sash, her lifeline to the divine. Uh, it's, it's always such a pleasure to visit Nefertari's tomb. We have millions of visitors uh, that go to Egypt every year, and I, I would I would guesstimate that the total number of visitors that that visit Nefertari's tomb every year is just the hundreds. It's in the Valley of the Queens. It's kind of off the the beaten trail a little bit for your traditional tours, but we always make a a, a point to to go to Nefertari's tomb just because it is so spectacularly beautiful and also ultimately for the, the meaning behind the scenes here, where now we're looking at Osiris and his light body uh, garment, his crossed garment, uh, always of course with his red sash on, his, his lifeline to the divine realm. It's to me one of the most peaceful places uh, anywhere on the planet. And it's always just a very special moment to be able to just go into this tomb. 33,000 plus year old tomb and, and just contemplate what it is actually that we are looking at here of a human on her path to ascension and this quest that she had, that Nefertari had for transmutation, for coming face to face with the gods and becoming a celestial being. Nefertari, of course, is uh, also portrayed, she's, she's the wife, as I mentioned earlier, of Ramses the Great. So she's often portrayed in, in statues at Karnak and elsewhere. And even in these statues uh, here at Luxor, I'll always make a beeline when we uh, visit the Luxor temple to go see, pay homage, if you will, to, to Ramses the Great, who we see here in these giant statues. And love connecting with Ramses the Great, have a real special affinity. Um, with these Ramses kings, um, but it's beyond Ramses. What I'm really there to see is, is Nefertari. She's tucked just underneath uh, her husband, 
She's shown uh, much smaller, of course. The king is always shown as this massive being of perfection. But standing beside him are these just absolutely, just truly elegant scenes of, of Nefertari, she of the beautiful face, as she was called, uh, that are absolute masterpieces of, of sculpture. And in all these instances, we, we see the same scenario. She is wearing her transparent linen garment, which is to me portrayed, as we see here on the right, quite hauntingly. And it tells us that this, again, is the object of the ancient Egyptian mysteries, is to, to craft this light body. We craft it through our thoughts, we craft it through our intentions, but especially we craft it through our, our connection with, with Ptah. And Ptah is, again, the God. He can enter into our dream state and assist us in our ascension. And we'll, again, we're going to come back and talk about that. Because it was here at Saqqara in Lower Egypt, which is actually the northern part of the country, that this complex was entirely developed, or excuse me, devoted to Ptah and the Stargate mysteries of the ancient Egyptians. This complex was built by the world's first acknowledged architect. His name is Imhotep. He was sort of the Leonardo da Vinci of his age who built this stairway to heaven, and also the massive mi four miles of tunnels that honeycomb the Saqqara complex underneath the stairway to heaven or step pyramid are four miles of tunnels that run out into the desert. And think of just the, the enormity of this complex that, that Imhotep was able to conceive and execute. A commoner by birth, Imhotep, whose name means the one who comes in peace, was the high priest of the King Zoser. He was called the son of Ptah, and he is the first human engineer, architect, and physician in history known by name. In depictions that we find at, uh, at Saqqara and elsewhere, we see Imhotep seated on his feathered ascension throne. It's feathered because it flies. Jewish mystics later called it the, the Merkaba throne. And it tells us that Imhotep himself probably ascended. He was certainly deified centuries later, especially by the Greeks, who tell us that he actually is the first human to become a god. Think about that. The first human to become a deified being was Imhotep, who conceived this whole complex at Saqqara and was referred to as a son of Ptah. Some people think that means he was actually an incarnation of Ptah on earth. Trivia, Imhotep was the one who coined the saying, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. But actually, I think what he meant was, for tomorrow we shall ascend. So as the son of Ptah, we can have some wiggle room here to speculate that he had the consciousness of Ptah. He may have, might have been an incarnation of Ptah, an earthly incarnation. Maybe he was channeling Ptah. Whatever way, we have to assume or speculate safely, comfortably, that he had the expanded consciousness of Ptah. And this is in part what enabled him to conceive of Saqqara and to execute this incredible complex. Well, it's very interesting that the ancient Egyptians taught that by his will, by his thought, Ptah brought the world into existence. It was first conceived by thought and realized by the word. Ptah conceives the world by the thought of his heart and gives life through the magic of his word. Think about that. Think about that in light of what we know today about quantum physics and about how we have to feel it, to believe it, to see it, that if we want to manifest something in our lives, we're taught now to feel it in our heart, to feel it as if it was actually already in existence, in your reality, and to get into that emotional state of what it would be like to have experienced that new job, that, that item you want to manifest, that relationship or whatever. Feel it to live it. Ptah exactly exemplifies this quantum principle. 
And then through the power of his word, he brings existence or creation into existence. Well, what is a word? Well, our word is a vibration. In the beginning was the word, according to the Gospel of John, and the word is love. So we've just circled back now to Pata, haven't we, who through the power of his heart, through the power of love, he's able to manifest. And then assisting that manifestation is the power of his word or vibration. Isn't it interesting in that context that when we look at Pata's resurrection stick, we look to the bottom part of it, where his feet would be, looks resembles highly resembles a tuning fork. It makes me wonder if this resurrection stick is in fact some kind of a manifestation stick that, that Pata was able to use to transmit or to actualize his word or his thought, excuse me, his thoughts. So Pata, very, very powerful extraterrestrial being bringing very powerful quantum technology, perhaps genetic technology to earth and infusing this ancient Egyptian civilization with his consciousness at Saqqara through his son, Imhotep. It's also at Saqqara, of course, where we find the incredible pyramid of Unas or what's left of it. It's kind of a, uh, in pretty dilapidated state these days. But about 60, 70 feet beneath that temple, that pyramid, we find what are called the pyramid texts. And these are considered to be among the oldest religious texts in the world. According to one of their interpreters, Faulkner, a scholar, the pyramid texts should be regarded as part of the Egyptian star religion. In fact, I would go so far to say is that it's actually the Egyptian star gate religion. Because what the pyramid texts describe is the software, the stargate metaphysics that goes with the utilization of the hardware, the step pyramid, in fact, all pyramids, including the Great Pyramid itself. In, this, in these texts, we learn of utterances that talk about the king becoming a flash of lightning. The purpose of these texts is to assist the king in the process of his divination, providing knowledge and also magic power to the king in the afterlife. The king is entombed underneath this pyramid with these texts written on the walls. His ba or soul comes out of his body at death and can read these texts. In fact, what we're told is that these texts are actually magically active. It's not so much that the, the, the soul reads these texts, but it's more that these texts act upon, in a magical way, the soul, assisting it in its transformation into a being of light. In Utterance 215, the king ascends to the skies as a star. The king joins the sun god, Ray. A stairway to the sky is set up for me that I may ascend on it to the sky. There's a summons to the celestial ferryman. I have come to you that you may ferry me across in this ferry boat in which you ferry the gods. The ferry boat, of course, is the Ark of the Millions of Years, the wormhole-shaped boat. The king climbs to the sky in a ladder. The gods who are in the sky are brought to you. The gods who are on earth assemble for you. They place their hands under you. They make a ladder for you so that you may ascend on it into the sky. The doors of the sky are thrown open to you. The doors of the starry firmament are thrown open for you. These are all utterances from the pyramid text that tell us of the transmutation of the Pharaoh into a being like lightning and the opening of portals or gateways into the stars on to, into which the king ascends. Now, one of the most magical, in my view, of the hieroglyphs that we see on the pyramid text or in the pyramid text is this glyph here. It was pointed out to me by Laird Scranton in his book on the sacred symbols of Egypt. This is the Egyptian hieroglyph to tear. The Egyptian hieroglyph to tear. 
we see it all over the place in Egypt. So it's not just isolated to the pyramid text. But what Laird Scranton pointed out, which was absolutely mind-blowing, is that the Egyptian hieroglyph to tear symbolically matches the tearing of the fabric of space-time in a wormhole growing. Now, that's a magic moment right there because that, that perfectly dovetails with what we have been already shown at the Temple of Dendera with the Ark of the Millions of Years matching the shape of the wormhole and the idea that the light body is able to open or tear holes in the fabric of space-time and travel via wormholes throughout eternity. To pull a riff from ancient aliens, is it possible? that this is how the gods and the ascended humans travel the stars. I believe it is. That is my operating hypothesis or premise. And this is what I keep, it's one reason I keep going back to Egypt to, to understand this, to look for more clues about how they affected this transformation or transmutation of the Pharaoh into a being of light. The king becomes a flash of lightning. Well, we know for certain that the Great Pyramid itself was a transmutation machine. It's a resurrection machine. That's what the Egyptians told us. It's an ascension device. And so here's this extraordinary photo, of, actually, of a lightning bolt striking the second pyramid. And it's more than just a fun photo because it points us in the direction of the nature of the light body that the ancient Egyptians told us they were transmuting into. Lightning is plasma. You have solids, liquid, gas, and there's a fourth state of matter, and that is plasma. All of us see plasma every day in the form of our sun. Our sun is in fact a big ball of gas and plasma. What they're telling us is that in our light body transformation, we change from this state of matter into a higher state of matter similar to what our sun is composed of, plasma. In fact, we're told that 99% of the universe is plasma. If you K-N-O-W plasma, if you know plasma, you know the universe is what we're told. If there is NO plasma, there's no universe, we're also told. So it's very important for us to, to speculate on or follow this line of, of thought that the ancient Egyptians were acutely aware of the powers of the sun and our kinship with the sun, that in fact, we could in fact become solar beings. Maybe another reason why the arc of the millions of years is referred to as the solar barge. So. When Claire and I are with groups in Egypt, we tend to like to kind of just play with the sun. And by that, I mean, we really are connecting with Ra or Ray in an extraordinary way. And, and asking Ray to awaken our consciousness, to send rays of light, of illumination into our being. It infuses us with great joy just to be in the motherland. Here we are on the Nile uh, at our hotel, the, the Luxor Hilton in, in Luxor. And just to be in this light is just a, a, a moment of remembrance for so many that, that join us. Because many, many, many of the people that, that come on tour with us believe that they've, they've had past lives in Egypt and they are retracing steps of... of uh, places they have been before and, and seeking to connect with the sun is one great way of doing this. It's wonderful uh, uh, temple scene here, excuse me, tomb scene from the tomb of Ramses the sixth, where we see the salute to the sun as this prayer posture is called with the solar barge on it, with the divine beings traveling on the sun. The ancient Egyptians aren't the only ones to tell us that the, the divine beings are connected with the sun. Buddha uh, came from the solar clan. Christ is called the sun god or the son of God. There's many, many connections to be made uh, with the sun as a conscious entity. And the Egyptians had this really acute sense 
that the sun played a vital role in our ascension. In fact, they, they taught that the way to heaven was through the sun. This is what we see here with the lions of yesterday and tomorrow on either side of the, the horizon symbol, the gateway symbol, with the sun in the center, indicating that the sun is the gateway to the heavenly realm. But again, the sun is plasma. This is a state of matter that was not identified or unidentified until 1879 when William Crookes invented the Crookes tube. He called plasma radiant matter. Basically, a Crookes tube is a glass bulb that gives off fluorescent light when a high voltage current is passed through it. The nature of the Crookes tube cathode ray matter was subsequently identified by British physicist Dr. or Sir J.J. Thompson in 1897 who called it plasma, or, or rather it was called plasma by Irving Langmuir uh, in, eight, in 1928. The cathode ray tube is something we use every day in our lives. It's the basis for television technology, your computer screen, all based on this original discovery and invention of William Crookes of the plasma tube. Now, some of you have probably anticipated where I'm going with this because you've, you may have seen something that looks just like a, cro a Crookes tube in ancient Egypt. And that, of course, is what we find in the, the crypt at Dendera, the Temple of Hathor or the Temple of Love and Joy. Famously, in the 1960s and early 70s, Eric von Donneken saw the Crookes tube or the, the, the light bulb, as he referred to it, at Dendera and said, this is, this is evidence of ancient alien technology, that this in fact is an early example of a, the use of electricity in ancient Egypt. And I think that that's entirely possible, but I also think there's a bigger mystery that is alluded to here. And that's what I wanna talk about with you all today. This is uh, the Temple of Hathor at Dendera, the Temple of Love and Joy always one of our favorite tour stops when we're in Egypt. It's one of the most peaceful places in Egypt among many peaceful places. Built around 330 BC by the Ptolemaic kings of, of Macedonia who took uh, power in Alexandria, Egypt and rebuilt many of these ancient Egyptian temples including Dendera which they built on the pad of a former temple that once existed here. In the ceiling of Dendera, in the interior is where we see these incredible scenes of the Ptolemaic kings, these humans who have gone through this process of transmutation and attained their non-molecular light body. In the crypt is where we find these extraordinary scenes that von Donneken identified as a light bulb, but what I'm going to suggest to you now may in fact be something even more mysterious than that. There are five of these chambers, these crypts underneath uh, the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. There was a statue of the goddess Hathor that was stored in here. It's a very sacred part of, of the temple. It's possible that because it's underneath the, the, the current level temple, that this may have been part of the original temple that was in place, the one that the Ptolemaic kings uh, built on top of. Here I am with my back uh, to the wall uh, that has the scene of the, the so-called light bulbs looking down uh, through the crypt. You can see it's very narrow and it has several chambers within it. And then on the wall that I'm standing at is where we actually see these light bulb scenes or so-called light bulb scenes. If they're not light bulbs, they're definitely, definitely plasma tubes. The, the, the symbolic correspondence is is very direct. In fact, in my opinion, it's more direct than this being some kind of an incandescent light bulb. So <clears throat> where my thinking took me on this is that if this is a plasma tube, who are the beings that are operating this plasma tube? And what are they ultimately trying to show us? Well, here is a plasma tube. A, a current day depiction of a plasma tube. What we see are a bunch of positrons in blue, the anti, which are the antimatter siblings of electrons, traveling down the, the tube of hot ionized gas or plasma in orange. 
And what we see is the wake of those uh, positrons as they go through the plasma. So compare that image with what we see at Dendera. Is the serpent a filament of a light bulb or is it the wake of positrons going through a tube of hot ionized gas? In my opinion, it's a plasma tube. And this is what is being, is being shown to us here. There are actually three representations of these plasma tubes at Dendera. There's one upstairs in color that I'm showing you here with these blue beings operating the plasma tubes. And there's one out back in a separate little chapel called the Isis Chapel, which talks about the birth. It's a birthing uh, chapel or chamber of, of Isis. And we also see the plasma tubes on the wall of this Isis Chapel. So these are the only three places in ancient Egypt where you will see these plasma tubes. And so they have to have some kind of powerful significance. And what I believe they, they're pointing us to is that the beings who are operating them are not flesh and blood beings. Look at the way they are portrayed at, on, on the wall here. They have double faces. They have double skins. That to me is a very telling clue. They're trying to tell us something about these beings who are considerably larger than this being who is kneeling underneath the plasma tube. You might describe them as giants compared to the kneeling figure who could be a human. Why do the ancient Egyptian artists, who do not make mistakes, by the way, their, their artistry is masterful in almost every single instance where you see it, why do they portray them with this double face? Is it because they're trying to show two people or multiple people holding or operating these plasma tubes? My opinion is that they're trying to show us that this is actually their double body. And what they're showing us is their etheric double, their ethereal body, their fog-like luminous light body, their plasma body, their plasma body that lives in a higher energy universe. As Robert Monroe, founder of the Monroe Institute says, the plasma body is normally invisible to the naked eye. And in order for it to be visible, it must either reflect or radiate light. I think that what we're looking at here are plasma life forms, plasma beings, who have bioplasma bodies. That's the light body of the gods. These are the electromagnetic bodies which generate electromagnetic fields and radiate electromagnetic waves similar to the aurora borealis of our planet, which is also plasma. When cosmic rays come from the, off the sun, stimulates the ionosphere and produces this extraordinary display of colored lights. <coughs> they, excuse me. They occur when the solar wind particles trapped by Earth's magnetic field collide with molecules of air in the upper atmosphere, the ionosphere, and they produce this incredibly spectacular sight of these rapidly shifting patches of color and dancing columns of light of various rainbow colored hues. The aurora borealis. Now, plasma is, as I said, a state of matter. Plasma is what lightning is composed of. Plasma is what our sun is composed of. So could it be possible that plasma is what the light body of these beings are also made of? Let me bring in another aspect of this story that takes us into a, what I feel is a confirmation that these light beings are in fact lightning-like or plasma beings. When we're looking at the Dendera tube, we're, look, we're thinking, A, it's a light bulb. Okay. B, it's a plasma tube. 
and that the being who is holding it is a plasma being. Third, what we're, we're basically looking at, and it's, it's simplest, most simplistic, symbolic view, is a person holding a serpent. Not only is this person holding a serpent, he appears to be lifting the serpent. You can absolutely argue that the tet column, that resurrection pillar at the very front of the plasma tube, is lifting the serpent. There's a very powerful story involving the lifting of a serpent, and that is the story of Moses, who lifted the serpent of healing in the wilderness. He raised a bronze serpent and healed the Israelites. Symbolically speaking, Moses lifting the serpent and this being in the plasma tube at Dendera are doing exactly the same thing. They're lifting the serpent. So how could this possibly play out? Well, what happens when Moses lifts the serpent of healing in the wilderness, he manifests a seraphim, a celestial being, an extraterrestrial being, an angel. In fact, the highest order of angels refer to as seraphim who are called winged serpents. I told you the winged serpent was going to be a very important symbol for us. And here it is coming back into our conversation. When Moses lifts the serpent of healing in the wilderness, referred to as the Nehushtan, the serpent of brass, he manifests a winged serpent or a seraphim. In the Jewish mystical book, the Hekelat Zutardi, we learn that the seraphim, they're walking is like the appearance of a lightning bolt. That means they're made of plasma. A vision of them is like a vision of a rainbow. Their faces are like a vision of a bride. Their wings are like the radiance of clouds of glory. Glory means to glow rays, to glow multicolored rays. That sounds like the auric field of the earth. That sounds to me just like these, the auric field of the human body. It sounds to me like we're talking about a group of beings who are made of plasma. They're lightning-like, plasma beings. The king, as the pyramids text said, becomes a flash of lightning. He becomes plasma. He becomes like these celestial beings. This is so important in my research because it carries forward into the Christian mysteries of resurrection. Jesus himself likens the secret of eternal life to Moses lifting a serpent of healing in the wilderness. And he says, as Moses lifted the serpent of healing in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Jesus is equating the secret of eternal life with Moses' lifting of the serpent in the wilderness. And I am equating Moses' lifting of the serpent of healing in the wilderness with the plasma tube at Dendera. Are we talking about an extraterrestrial science of ascension that is encoded on the temple walls in the crypt at Dendera in the story of Moses lifting the serpent of healing and ultimately manifesting a seraphim and ultimately linking it with the resurrection mysteries of Jesus and his transmutation into a being of light. 